first of all, my name is Scott Knutson. I'm with Signature Home Inspection. Um, we've been in business for close to 19 years now. Uh, we started the business up in Salt Lake City um, and then moved it down here approximately nine years ago. And we cover Orange County, North San Diego County, uh, South LA County, and then parts of uh, Riverside, San Bernardino. Uh, we do home and commercial inspections, sewer scopes. Uh, we have drone technology. We have infrared. Uh, we can do pool and spas. Uh, we can do mold testing as well as uh, radon testing that we just added this year. So if there's any questions you guys have on any of the services, uh, at the end, I'll give you my contact information. And uh, if you have any questions, you can go through that. So um, let's get started here. So this class is uh, called Avoiding Aggravations of the Home Inspection. So uh, this class has been kind of put together so we kind of help you uh, avoid the potential issues that come up during an inspection that can cause some problems. So um, if there's any questions, let me know. Um, but we're gonna go through this. So the course objectives, are going to be um, in this class. You're going to you're going to learn what's involved with the home inspection, uh, how best to prepare the seller for the home inspection, what the sellers can do to assist for a successful home inspection, how best to prepare the buyer for the home inspection, which is, in my opinion, crucial um, to making sure that the transaction goes smoothly because um, this is something that can come up and, and it can spook buyers and they start having second guess. Um, how to advise buyers in light of a, on a, of a defect that's found on an inspection, and then how to make sure home inspection doesn't kill the deal unnecessarily. So those are the course objectives that we're going to go through. All right, so home inspections are a normal part of the home buying process. Um, with proper preparation, common issues and delays can be avoided, helping everyone. So uh, a couple of topics we're going to go through and I'll go through these slides. Um, I might not stick exactly to the slides because I've taught this so much um, and, and we'll probably give you my opinion as an inspector for how long I've been doing it for and the common things that we see. So you have to keep in mind, we're probably doing about 100 inspections a month uh, between the uh, four of us. And um, so we are dealing with different real estate agents, different buyers, different sellers. And this is stuff that we see over time of what uh, can impact uh, or cause problems with the home inspection. So the first thing is gonna be prepare the home and the buyer. Um, my recommendation is this, is if you're the buyer agent or if you're the listing agent, um, when you get to the property to open it up, uh, my recommendation is, is um, treat that house like it is um, like you're still showing the house. There's been so many times when we go into the property and all the blinds are drawn, all the lights are off, it's dark, it's dim. And, um, you know, usually if that's not done where the lights are on, the blinds are open, if we get there early enough, we will go in and do that. Um, we'll try to get that open up so we can, one, we need to see, and two, it just makes it look a lot better for the buyer when they're there. So uh, just because they're at the home inspection process, the sale still hasn't closed yet. So try to present that property as best you can. Uh, and then the other thing too is, is make sure that the buyer is aware of what a home inspection is. There are some common misperceptions out there where buyers think that we're going to be tearing stuff apart. We're going to be pulling carpet back. We're going to be cutting holes in the walls. We're going to be doing all this dismantling when it's actually a visual inspection. So they need to be aware that it's a visual inspection. They need to be aware that we are going to find stuff. Uh, it's very rare that we don't find something and, you know, just, just, Try to prepare them for the inspection. Let them know what the process is. Um, the other thing I would recommend is, is that if you can uh, limit who comes to the inspection, um, I can't tell you how many times where the, I, I know it's hard sometimes, but they will bring, you know, the father-in-law, they will bring a contractor, they will bring somebody that doesn't really need to be there during the home inspection. And those people start putting doubts in the um, buyer's minds and they start, you know, second guessing things. Um, you know, it, it, we see it all the time. So my recommendation is that if you can limit who is at the inspection, it's going to be, it's going to go a lot smoother. Um, also, uh, maintaining a professional image. 
um, you probably want to try to get a home inspector that is going to be professional. Um, you don't want somebody that's going to show up in a t-shirt with no logo. Um, you know, they've got a dirty truck. They've got, um, you know, they're, they're, the oil's leaking from their truck on the driveway. You know, make sure that you're uh, directing your clients to a proper home inspection company that will make you look professional. Um, you know, there's times where um, we get this all the time where somebody will say, um, you know, my real estate agent gave me a list of three home inspectors. I went and looked them up online and they've all got bad reviews. So when we were just researching um, the people that they gave us, uh, we found you and all your positive reviews and we decided to hire you. So if you guys have a list out there that you're giving to your clients, make sure you have vetted those home inspectors and make sure that they look good online as well. Because um, the last thing you want to do is hand out a, res you know, a list of three and then your clients go online and see that they don't have very good reviews. Um, so, you know, make sure you're maintaining your professional image. Um, and then, you know, we're going to go through the avoiding common aggravations and delays in the inspection and buying process, because there are things that will delay the inspection. Um, one, for example, is, is that um, the utilities are not on. I, you know, there's been several times where we go out to the property, utilities are off and it's limited. We're still going to inspect what we can, but in our report, we're going to have to know that the gas was off or the power was off or the water was off. Um, now, there may be some inspectors that are okay with turning that stuff on. Liability wise, uh, it's not a wise thing. Uh, when I first started doing this, I used to think, okay, I'll just turn the water on. Uh, it only takes that one time where once we turn that water on and then there's the reason why it was turned off because it was a leak somewhere in the house. And so we stopped doing any of that kind of stuff because of the liability that's involved with it. So um, you'd want to make sure. And I know that you will say, you know, people will say, well, I talked to the listing agent and they said it was all on. Um, if you are in the area, you may want to swing by and check to make sure um, because you know, that's usually the common thing that we hear is that the listing agent said it was on and the listing agent doesn't know. They probably haven't been to the house since they got the, the listing. So uh, kind of keep that in mind. So we're going to go through that as well. So um, as far as scheduling of the inspections, you want to let the buyer know that they need to uh, delay scheduling until it's certain that all utilities are on. The other thing that we're seeing right now in this market is that people are scheduling inspections without a ratified contract. Um, I would avoid that as if all possible because it, 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 you know, it causes problems with scheduling and it uh, takes up unnecessary spots that um, we would normally be able to open up for somebody else. So let them know um, that, you know, make sure that all the utilities are on before they schedule some. Um, if we go out to the property and something's off, like I said, we will still inspect the home, but we will disclose what's off. If we have to come back to the property, there is a return fee to, to come back to a property because I have to pay my guys. Um, you know, we don't get paid the same as you guys do. Uh, we get paid for a time slot. And, um, you know, if we have to come back, it's, it's difficult typically to get it in our schedule because our schedules are usually three or four days out. And, um, we don't have access to super. So we're pretty much limited on when we can get in there and get out. So uh, doing this will save time for everybody. So that's kind of one of the main, you know, one of the big things that we run into is that utilities are not on or something's not going or it's not ready. I mean, even on new construction, um, we go out to the property and they don't even have a gas meter installed yet. Um, and, you know, they, you know, they still have painters there, you know, there's, it, it's still under construction. Um, you know, it's like, uh, sometimes we're there and we're like, why are we even here? It's the house isn't ready. So, you know, it's kind of, you know, kind of keep up on that, you know, if, if you're setting an appointment. Uh, all right, so prepare the buyer. So this is a big one. I, I can't emphasize this enough. And this will cut down on a lot of headaches because um, um, buyers, you know, if they don't understand the process, and, and I have another class that I teach as well. Um, it's, um, it's called managing the home inspection. That will go into this a little bit more detailed. Um, and I try to give some tidbits on what we have, uh, that what, what we recommend. So, you know, prepare the buyer, let them know that there is no such thing as a perfect home. 
um, that just, you know, tell them home inspectors are going to find something. So be prepared for that. Um, unless it's a brand new house, you know, the, they, you know, what I usually do during a review is I just let them know and say, listen, this house is a 1960 house. Some of the items that we have found were pretty common back then, but we report on how houses are built today. So for example, back in 1965, if a GFCI wasn't uh, required, we would still note that on our report because that is something that is recommended that they have installed, uh, you, you know, especially around kitchen sinks, bathrooms, and so forth. So, uh, you know, if you can prepare the buyer that there's no perfect home. Um, this cushions the news of anything less than perfect. That lets them know that, uh, you know, we're typically there to find stuff. So, uh, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. So, um, you know, those, you know, do your best to prepare the buyer as much as possible. Um, you know, if you guys have any questions on this, if you want any recommendations, um, but you know, that's to me, we, we run into that quite a bit where the buyer gets there and we start going through our review. And, and I would say we're some of the most non alarmist inspectors out there. We try our best to put the findings in the most positive spin that we can and let them know that, you know, you can resolve pretty much any kind of issue. It's just depends on how much the buyer is willing to deal with it or, you know, take on whatever we found. So. Um, and then also, you know, I hear this from some of the top agents that we work with, uh, and I can hear them in the background, you know, when we're doing the inspection is, you know, they usually will just tell the buyer, say, listen, we'll get the report, we'll go through it together, and we'll go through the items that we, you know, they'll maybe pick five, or there may be pick 10, or however many items that we're going to focus on these, uh, because these are the ones that in, in, in their experience, they've been able to get resolved. Um, and I, you know, the other day I did an inspection for a guy and after I did the review, he took me out back and he goes, that gutter, the nail on the gutter is loose. And I'm like, you know, don't let that, you know, ruin your deal. You know, I, and I just told him, I said, you know, it's an easy fix. And I explained to him, you know, you would just want to get a hammer or, or depending on whatever the nail is or the screw and screw it back in. And I said, it's an easy fix. Don't let this hold up your deal. Um, there, we, we still run into a lot of buyers that think that they're going to ask for everything, um, that we have on our report. And it's just not going to be feasible in today's market. So, um, prepare them as much as possible and your transaction will go through a lot smoother. Um, I, I promise you that, uh, prepare the buyer. This is just a little comic strip that they put in here. So, um, you know, take it for what it's worth. Um, anyway. Um, so you're fired. Gosh, you know, not really, but now 2% raise won't seem so bad. This job is all about managing expectations. All right. So expectations may vary based on the newness of the house and the condition of the home when toured. Uh, some homes have lower expectations than others. Um, you know, we inspect all kinds of different houses. We have, you know, last week we did uh, a 20,000 square foot house, a uh, $20 million house. It had two properties. It had the biggest game room I've ever seen. And again, I've been doing this a long time. It had a dance club. It had an actual movie theater with a snack bar. And so, you know, we do homes from that and we also will do small condos. So, you know, you also have to think about, you know, your buyer, uh, where are they at? How familiar are they with a home? Um, there are times when we're doing a review and buyers have no idea uh, about a lot of the stuff that we're talking to them about. So uh, you're probably going to have to hold their hands with just a little bit more. So again, you know, if you don't have an inspection company that you're regularly working with and that you're comfortable with, uh, I'd suggest that you have a few of those to where if one of them's booked, you feel confident with another one. A lot of the agents that we work with, um, they tell us that they give out the two, two names or three names. And regardless of who their home buyer is going to select, they're going to be, they're going to feel comfortable with that inspector. Uh, so, you know, just set the expectations with your buyer, uh, depending on the house. Um, you know, there's been times where I've gone into a house and it's yellow shag carpeting. Um, and, you know, the, the buyer is going to say, no, I already know about that. You know, I, I, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. I'm going to rip all that out. Um, you know, so you just have to keep that in mind. You know, what are they planning on doing with this house? Uh, and that also helps the inspector because um, if I go into a property and I know they're going to go in there and gut it, 
you know, I can approach it a little bit differently because I can say, all right, I'm not going to focus on these items during the review. I'm going to focus on the big ones. I'm going to say, listen, you told me that you were more concerned about the structure. You were more concerned about the roof and the HVAC. So I'm going to really explain those to you and let you know, okay, this is the age of the HVAC, for example, and this is how old it is. This is what you need to do to bring it up to current, uh, um, I don't like to say the word code, but, um, you know, current standards to where they, um, you know, you can get, you know, more lifespan out of it, have it serviced, for example. So make sure you're preparing the buyer. So yeah, I mean, this is probably a, a $400,000 house in somewhere in California with the way prices are going. Uh, and then also I just let them know, you know, and you should let them know, no home is perfect, even new ones. This is a roof, a ridge vent on a brand new home. Uh, it's, you know, this is stuff that you might not see from the ground when you're looking at the home. Um, I always tell people, you know, flipped homes, houses that have been recently flipped are probably the hardest homes for a home inspector to inspect because there's a lot of stuff that have been, I don't want to say hidden, but, um, you know, you don't really know until we get into it. You know, I did a house the other day where I was in the bathroom, the bathroom looked good. I looked underneath the um, vanity, which was, it was a vanity that you could see underneath to the tile and the tile underneath wasn't grouted. You know, there was no grout. Um, the tiles weren't coming up, but they'd missed the grout and they didn't, you know, nobody saw it until we got out of there. So, um, you know, it's just stuff that uh, is difficult to see sometimes on these uh, flipped homes. And, you know, I went into a house the other day where everybody was ranting and raving about the house because visually being in the house for the short amount of time that they were before, everything looked brand new. But as I'm going through the house, I'm like, you know, there was some sub subpar work that had been done on this house. And we want to make sure that we're, you know, explaining that to them. That's, you know, this was not done right. The, the light fixture in the bathroom was loose. The outlet was loose. Stuff that looks fine when you first look at it. But once you start touching it and putting plugs in and stuff, you can tell that there's an issue. So, you know, you just have to let them know that, you know, there's no home that's perfect. Even the new ones have issues. Um, also, so the other thing that you want to make sure that the home buyer is aware of is that when... Uh, they schedule an inspection. So I don't know how uh, each of you schedules the inspections, but um, you can either schedule an inspection on the phone, you can schedule it via text message, you can schedule it online. Um, most of our, I, I would say the last six months, I would say 60% of our inspections are coming in on, on through our online schedule on our website, which is great for us because it makes it a lot easier. We don't have to burn manpower to take that call and listen to that stuff. Um, but um, we do our best to let them know that once we take the order and put it in the system, the next thing that's going to happen is, is that they're going to get a confirmation email. They will get a confirmation email. The real estate agent will get the confirmation email. Listing agent will get a confirmation email. That way, all parties are aware that, you know, there's an inspection happening on this time. Inside the buyer's confirmation or the seller's confirmation, whoever ordered the inspection, they will get an email that has a link to the inspection agreement. So um, the inspection agreement is basically uh, an agreement between us and the buyer that lets them know that they've hired us to do the inspection. Uh, for a certain amount of fee, and it also goes through what's covered and what's not covered during the inspection. Um, and it pretty much outlines the terms of the inspection. So um, if you are a real estate agent ha and have never heard of an inspection agreement, or your, um, your inspector does not require home inspection agreement, uh, if they do not have an inspection agreement, they most likely are not insured. Uh, if in our business, we have to have an inspection agreement signed prior to stepping foot in the house. It has to be done. We have to have it or our insurance company will not insure us and they will not reinsure you as well because we have um, uh, real, real estate um, insurance to where when you've referred us, it'll cover uh, you guys as well. So uh, inspection agreement is critical. Uh, ex you know, we try to do our best when somebody calls in, we try to do our best to explain to them that, hey, you know, I'm going to put your order in. Uh, you're going to get an inspection agreement. This is how you sign it. It's basically like a DocuSign. Once they DocuSign it, it's all connected to their, um, their account in our system. And we can see that it's on file. We can see when it's been signed. Um, if they don't receive it, we can resend it to them. 
Um, so anyway, that's what the inspection agreement is. If you haven't heard of that before, uh, you know, it can be called contract as well, but it's basically an inspection agreement. Uh, so it explains what items are not inspected, contract between the buyer and inspector, helps to eliminate surprises and confusion and helps to limit liability for the inspector and the real estate agent. Because like I was saying earlier, there's a hold harmless clause in there that will hold you guys harmless if uh, they come back and say, well, you referred him to me and he wasn't, you know, he did something wrong. Um, there's a clause in there for that. So, so, you know, make sure that you have that because most home inspectors will not um, start without that. They have to have it. If we don't have it in the beginning and we send it out, send out the inspection report without it, it will lock down the report so they can't access it until we have that signed. So um, we get that sometimes where we'll send out the report for whatever reason, we couldn't get the inspection agreement or we had to redo it because they added some different services. When we send the email and they click on it, it'll say, um, you know, sign your inspection agreement here before you have access to it. Um, all right, so your reaction to the inspection. If you are there, your reactions to things can influence inspection positively or negatively. So relax when you're there. Read a magazine, help buyer take measurements, discuss closing, let the inspector answer questions. So um, what we typically do is that if the buyer is there at the beginning, um, we do a rundown of, okay, this is what's going to happen. This is the way we're going to do this. This is, you know, we're going to start on the outside. We're going to uh, do the roof. We're going to come in through the garage. Then we'll start in the kitchen and then we'll work our way up to the attic or vice versa. Uh, sometimes people will start up top so where they can run the faucets and the tubs. So if there's any leaks, then when they go downstairs, they can see it. Um, so we'll outline that process. Um, there are times when buyers will want to follow us around. In my experience, that slows down the process. What we try to do is let them know that we're going to do a review at the end with everybody and go over all their questions. So what I usually tell them is, is if they're going to be there at the beginning is say, you know, here's a tape measure. This is your two hours or your three hours that you have on, you know, feathered access to the home, you know, go look around you know, touch things, open drawers, get the feel for the house uh, if they're there at the beginning. Um, if you want the process to move faster, because I know sometimes real estate agents will be checking their watch on a regular basis and want to know how, what time is it, how long is it going to be, you know, as a real estate agent, if you want us to be faster and, and not be distracted, um, have them come at the end. It's, in my opinion, it's best that they come at the end when we're starting to wrap up because that way we're not distracted. Um, maybe there are some inspectors out there that don't get distracted, but I know myself and everybody on my team, it's a lot harder to focus on what we're trying to do when we have somebody right on our tails asking questions the whole time. So it's, you know, it's, it's, it's better in my opinion uh, that we, you know, have, that we can focus on what we're doing and then do the review at the end. So, um, so anyway, and I know that a lot of real estate agents will use this time to sign documents, do other kinds of things. That's great. That's fine. Um, you know, and then wait for us at the end. But, you know, if it's a house, that's going to take four hours. Um, do they really need to be there the four hours? I, you know, I don't think so. You know, most of the time, you know, I, I find that the buyers, you know, appear to get bored and they're sitting on the stairs and they're looking at their phones and they're just kind of counting down the time to find out when, you know, when it's going to be ready for them. So uh, time wise, I would just, like I said, have them come at the end if they're going to come. Um, but, you know, you can't control them. You know, sometimes they want to be there the whole time. So. Um, but you as a real estate agent, you know, put them at ease, you know, don't show any stress. Uh, don't, uh, you know, have, you know, like I said, get there, prepare the property, have it ready to go. Uh, so, you know, you're, you know, again, you know, they want to see this house, they're going to be there. So, all right. So if a smile is contagious, then nervousness is completely infectious. So keep that in mind. All right. So be calm if you visit or stay during the inspection. A lot of times, if I know it's going to be a four hour inspection and they're there at the beginning, I'll just say, listen, you know, I'm going to be done. Uh, you know, if we typically do 10 o'clock and two o'clock appointments, 
Um, if the house is going to take me, um, you know, a lot of times people call and they say, how long is it going to take? Well, usually we tell people one hour per thousand square feet. Um, but we don't know until we get to the house what kind of shape it's in. If I get to the house and there's a bunch of boats and stuff in the front yard, the grass hasn't been mowed, then I'm probably in for a little bit longer of an inspection than, you know, one hour per thousand square feet. So once I get there, then I have a pretty good idea how long it's going to take. Um, usually it takes about 45 minutes to do the outside of a house if there's no pool or anything. And then once we get inside, then it goes, you know, usually goes quite a bit quicker. Um, uh, if the sellers are there, it'll slow down the process. Uh, that's something that would be an aggravation uh, for a home inspection is because they tend to, um, you know, they want to manage everything. They want to ask questions. They want to try to fix stuff. Uh, it's best that the sellers are not there during the buyer's home inspection. Um, listing agents tend to like to show up. Um, if you're the listing agent and um, you come uh, an hour after the home inspector started and then start asking questions about what uh, he's found, um, you know, it's going to slow down the process. It's going to make the process longer. Um, if you are a listing agent that come in, you know, if you're there for the review, come in, wait for the review, and then, you know, everybody will go over it at the same time. Uh, that way, the inspector's not having to disclose findings twice or even three times. I mean, there's been times where I've been in an inspection, and every time somebody shows up, the first thing they ask me is, what have you found so far? You know, and I understand that, but, you know, me having to explain that to three different people uh, could easily add uh, 20 minutes to the inspection um, that we could have saved, to, you know, to get everybody out of there faster. So uh, back to where it says calm. If you are nervous, then the buyer may get the feeling that something is wrong or that there's some big secret about the home. Um, I see this uh, when we're doing inspections. Um, there's real estate agents that we become really good friends with and that we've, uh, you know, we like to chit chat. But as soon as the buyer shows up, uh, the chit chat stops and it's all professional from there. And I get it. You know, we want to make sure that, uh, you know, they're comfortable with the whole process and, and don't think that we're all in cahoots on the process. All right, so back to the voiding common aggravations. So the number one thing that we kind of come across is the utilities are not on. So this is gonna be a water meter um, out towards the street. Um, we don't typically see these locks. These locks can be easily cut off, um, but the ones that the water company uh, will put on there are ones that cannot be to cut off. They're, they're, they're there, they're designed in a way where you can't get anything to cut them off. They have to be taken off by the, by the um, uh, water company. So um, if we get to a house and there's no water on, the first thing I'm gonna check is the main shutoff, which is usually out front of the house. If that one's on, and then I, and then I know that it's been shut off at the street. So that's typically going to slow things down because uh, in order to check the plumbing, um, you know, we have to have the water on. So if we have to wait um, to have the water come on, it, it could take two or three days before they can get out there to turn the water on. Uh, gas meter. I, I need to update these pictures because I don't know whose pictures these are, these master locks, because these these locks like this one here um, is an actual lock that covers the whole thing now. So these are some older locks. I need to update the pictures. <clears throat> but this is the gas meter being shut off. Uh, if the gas meter is being shut off, uh, we can't check ranges. We can't check water heaters. We can't check furnaces. So there's several things. We're going to still inspect the furnace. We're going to still inspect the water heater. We just won't know that it's operational until the gas is on. So uh, in gas companies, they could be two or three days as well. So um, if you've got a five-day contingency and uh, we get out to the property on day two, you're not going to meet those contingencies. You're going to have to go back to the seller and say, we need to extend because we weren't able to do our inspections. Um, let's see, I need to take this photo out. This is just a picture of the thing. So, all right, so back in the, um, you know, avoiding common aggravations. Uh, the second one that we see a lot is objects in the way. Um, now I understand that what happens a lot of times is when people are staging their house or they're trying to declutter to make it look good, they move everything into the garage. Um, that might not even be the case. I mean, I know that there's people that do not even use their garages. I'm so against that. Like I make sure that I can get both my cars in the garage because that's what my garage is for. I've got shelving. I've got everything in there. So everything fits nice and neat. Um, but 
there are going to be instances. So if we were to go into a garage like this, we're not going to be moving stuff. Liability wise, we do not move personal items because if something breaks, then we're liable for it. And we don't want to have that happen. So what sometimes people will do is so we can get access to the walls and stuff. Um, they will usually tell their seller to prepare the garage the best they can. Uh, so we can at least have access to the surrounding portions of the wall. Uh, any items that we can't get to or any areas, we're going to have to take a photo and we're going to have to note that in the report that we weren't able to get to a certain area because of uh, access or access storage. Uh, just some more pictures here, uh, two more cycles underneath the hatch. So if there's a, say, for example, up here on the roof, you have in the garage, you have the attic access. Um, you know, we're not able to get in that attic. So if we're not able to get in that attic because this stuff hasn't been moved, um, we're going to have to disclose that we were not able to get access to the attic. And most likely they're going to have to schedule a reinspection to have us come back out. So if you're a listing agent, um, try to make sure that we have access to access hatches, electrical panels, crawl space hatches, anything that we need to have access to, make sure that we have it. If there's tenants there, make sure that nobody's sleeping in the bedrooms. Make sure if they've got pets and stuff, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but make sure they're confined. Um, make it easy for the inspector to do his job so he can get in and get out and, and make the, the process smooth. Uh, obstructions. So this would be electrical sub panel. So this is the electrical panel blocked by drywall and a washing machine. So underneath this, there's a washing machine that we don't have safe access to get it open. And then the sheetrock has been uh, blocked by the drywall or the, the panel has been uh, blocked by the uh, drywall. So with that, um, it's not our home. Uh, we're not going to, you know, rip things open just to get them open. Uh, this is something that would need to be taken care of before we get there. Um, also, if the panel's behind something and we don't have free access to safely remove the cover, we're going to have to note in the report that it was unsafe to remove the cover because we, you know, we're not going to be laying on our belly on the washer machine unscrewing uh, panel covers. It's just not something that's safe. Uh, see this quite a bit um, on some older homes. They don't put these hatches in closets anymore, but on some older homes, they start putting the hatches in the panels and then uh, owners, homeowners will go in here and put uh, storage shelves in the closet. Uh, we just, there's just no way to get in that attic uh, unless you're a really, really skinny guy. And most home inspectors are not gonna be skinny like that. Um, in this instance, what we may try to do is put our ladder here pop open the hatch and you know our best bet is to be able to just to stick our um, you know hand up there uh, with a camera and snap some photos that way or snap some videos and do our best to see what we can see in the attic but most homes today in our area the furnace is going to be up in the attic the ductwork is going to be up there uh, the the bathroom vents are going to be venting so we need to see in the attic if this is obstructed um, you know, and, and it's not something that can be taken out right away, then um, they're going to have to do that later. And then we're going to have to reschedule an inspection if they want that area inspected. So do your best to uh, eliminate obstructions so we can get in. Um, <clears throat> delays can be avoided by asking the sellers to remove anything blocking access. So if you're a listing agent, make sure that you ask your seller to clear pathways in those areas that I mentioned earlier. Have an area is blocked or sealed off, leave a buyer with questions and doubts, such as what is under there? Uh, was it blocked off on purpose? Um, you know, there's been times where um, after our inspection, um, during the final walkthrough, we get a call from a client or the realtor and saying there's a big hole in the living room and in, in the living room wall. And I'm like, well, I would have noted that if I would have known, you know, if I would have saw if it was there. Uh, I go back, look at the pictures, and there's a big picture frame that they'd hung up on the wall and uh, they were covering a hole. Well, most home inspectors are not going to be looking behind every single picture frame. It's just not something that we're there for. So, uh, you know, during it's very important during your final walkthrough that, you know, you're checking this kind of stuff uh, to make sure that, you know, and, and we take a lot of pictures. So in our reports, you'll be able to go back to reference it. Um, but, um, you know, if there's any access for whatever reason, buyers start to get a little, you know, hey, what's going on here? So the other thing, too, is avoiding aggravations are pets. This is another one that's a, that can be an issue. 
where we get to a property and they don't want to uh, cage their dogs, for example. I can't tell you how many times where we get there and the owners will say, okay, the dog's going to be out back. And then when you come inside, then I'll move him back outside uh, or I'll move him in the garage. The thing, the problem with that is that we need unfeathered access um, because there's times where we may go say we say, for example, we start on the inside and the, the, the dog is in the, the garage. Well, we start on the outside, we we're go around to the garage, and then all of a sudden we see a potential area where we can see some water damage. Well, in order to determine where it's, you know, where it's going into, then at that point, once we see that, then we need to get in the garage so we can look at that area uh, from the outside. Well, if we've got a dog in there that's not caged, we got to get the homeowner involved. They got to move it again, or a lot of times they're not even there and the dog's just in. So it's best that they take the pets out of the property um, and remove them. And I know there's been people say, uh, for example, uh, oh, our, all dog, all, our dog loves everybody. He doesn't bite anybody. You know what? Dogs can be finicky. I, you know, I've got a dog. My dog loves everybody, ignores most dogs, but for some reason, when it sees a white poodle, it goes crazy. It does not like white poodles. And so that's the same with dogs. We've had dogs where the homeowner said, oh, he loves everybody. He's nice. And then I get a call from one of my inspectors and he says, that dog just bit me. So, you know, liability wise, it's best to take any pets. The other thing that we see too, is we'll say, you know, there will be a, cat, a bunch of cats in the house and we'll get there and the sign on the door will say, please keep windows and doors closed behind you. We have cats, we don't want them to get out. Well, that's fine, we can do that, but I can't control who's coming in behind me. I can't control the contractor that comes later on. I can't control uh, the uh, aunts and uncles that wanna see the house when the inspection's being done. Um, so that's that, that can be an issue because we may have closed the door behind us, but somebody came in behind us and left it open. So if you've got cats, either put them in a room or uh, put them in a cage, uh, you know, don't let them roam freely because if they get out, you know, I, we, we can't control it. That's the last thing we want is a cat to get out when we're doing an inspection. Um, so, you know, you know, make sure you can control these animals the best you can. So spec, not vicious, but very active. <laughs> this, you know, and that's the thing is we've seen these dogs where they look so nice and then for some reason they just don't like certain people. All right, so back to it. If there are pets in the home, ask the sellers to put pets in cages tie them outside away from the home or take them out on the town or out on a walk. Uh, tying the angry dog near the crawl space interest does not help much. It's kind of a joke there, but there's been times where I've gone in the backyard and I don't have certain access to the back of the yard because I've got a dog that won't let me in a certain area. So uh, also place notes where pets are contained. Um, we had one where I did just recently where they had the cats in the master bedroom. I knew that's where they were at. And I went in there, closed the door behind me so they didn't get in the rest of the house. And the, I was walking over to check the light fixture by the side of the bed. And I don't know where this cat just goes, Wah! just grabs my leg. And I don't think I've jumped so high because I didn't know. I, you know, it, it just scared me. I was like, ah, and I've never seen a cat that vicious. It was just not going to have me in there. So I ended up having to go downstairs, tell the seller, say, hey, I can't inspect this, you know, room, you know, because this cat is, you know, viciously attacking with its claws. And it's like, you know, I, I you know, I don't want to, you know, you got to, you got to move this cat so we can get in there. So uh, it's best that, you know, this stuff is taken care of before we get there. All right. So even friendly cats can be an issue. And this is back to what we were saying, thanks so much. It was a pleasure doing business with you. Explain exactly what I need to do to rem remedy some issues with the house. We'll definitely refer your business. Uh, called you on Monday morning here on Tuesday afternoon, have the inspection hand. PS, you were great with kitty, uh, great with kitty escape hardest. The seller's cat kept trying to get out. Feel free to use my email. So anyway, again, these cats, I had a cat at one time and it, once I let it go outside, it wanted outside all the time. And uh, it got to the point where it was so annoying that every morning it was at the door. I'm like, no, you're not a dog. You're a cat, stay inside. Um, but they love to get outside. Some of them are just won't go anywhere, but so. All right, so weather. Uh, weather can be another aggravation. Not so much in Southern California. But for example, uh, with the way that we uh, inspect nowadays, uh, most inspection companies are using a software that's on their phone or on a tablet. Um, sometimes rain can slow that down because if it's raining hard, we're not able to type stuff in our uh, 
tablet because it's, you know, it's wet. So, you know, a lot of times we'll have to just kind of go outside, do that, you know, snap the photos and then retreat back to the garage to enter our findings. So it is a slower method, but that can help that, that can hinder. Uh, heat, heat, not so much. Uh, until probably the second inspection of the day where the inspector has been out in the heat all day, it might slow him down a little bit. If you have some cold water, uh, you know, feel free to offer it to our guys. Um, but, you know, back to it, you know, no control of the weather. Let the clients know that uh, I need uh, some other inspectors willing to need it. So some charge extra if there's uh, different weather patterns, but we don't. It's just something that we, you know, that happens. Uh, we sometimes will get buyers that will call us and say, uh, it's raining. Do we need to reschedule? And my first answer is no, we, that's actually good that it's actually raining because that helps us find leaks. Um, that's the best way to find leaks is if it's raining or doing the inspection. Uh, that's typically if, if a roof is going to leak, we're going to see it. Uh, there are some other things sellers can do to help the inspection go smoothly other than making areas accessible. Um, one of them is, is ask the sellers not to mop the floors prior to the inspection. Sure, the house will look clean, but if not yet completely dry, this may show up on a moisture meter. So if we get in areas where we're checking uh, areas of the house with a moisture meter and it's wet, it might falsely set off the moisture meter. So um, that's just one you know, item. Uh, remove uh, firewood away from the house. Um, I, you know, I can't tell how many times we see firewood right up against the house. Firewood attracts uh, wood destroying insects and um, it's just like bait for them. Same thing with crawl spaces. We get down a crawl space and there's a bunch of cardboard left over from the last plumber that was down there. That stuff, you wanna remove that kind of stuff because it is, it's organic and termites love to go for the you know, organic wood, especially cardboard, cause it's soft. It's a lot easier for them to chew into. Um, Another thing that we see a lot, we see this in attics, we see this in um, uh, garages, um, junction box covers or outlet covers. Um, we spend a lot of time writing up outlet covers that, or junction box covers or junction boxes or outlets that don't have covers on because they are a safety item if they don't have a cover on them or they can be a fire hazard if they're in the garage. So if there's any that are missing, have your seller go around and fix those before the home inspection get there. It's an easy fix. It doesn't take very long to do it and it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, the report, uh, get familiar with your home inspector's uh, inspection report. Um, if you wanna see a sample of what ours looks like, um, we started using a new company a few years ago and I absolutely love our report. It's easy to read, it's interactive, the photos expand, it's straight to the point, there's not a lot of fluff. Um, there's, there's, there's real estate agents and there's buyers that will send us reports from some other companies. And I open it up, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's a hundred pages and uh, it's giving me a headache because I can't, you know, it, there's no, I, it's difficult to read. So uh, make sure that you understand how the report works. Uh, do not assume all things mentioned are major or even importance to the buyer. Uh, an electrician may care very little about uh, regarding electrical issues. So um, for example, when we do a presentation, uh, when we present our findings, we categorize our findings into three categories and we color code them. So blue would be maintenance items. That's not something that we're going to typically go over during the review, but it's going to be in the report. So for example, it's going to be like cleaning out gutters, cutting back vegetation, stuff that can be done on a regular basis that may need to be done now. Uh, anything that would be orange would be recommended repairs or further evaluation. Um, you have to kind of, uh, this is how I try to prepare our buyers is I let them know and I say, listen, we're like a home, uh, uh, a general practitioner doctor. We know a little bit about everything on the house, but if we think we need a specialist, like a licensed electrician to further evaluate it or a licensed riffer, we're gonna make that recommendation of the report. And at that point, they would need to decide, okay, do we wanna have that guy come in or do we wanna uh, you know, deal with it afterwards? So uh, keep in mind, so orange would be red. And then, any, then we have uh, anything that would be health or safety related would be in red. And that could be as little as an outlet cover that's missing on an outlet because one, it's a safety item, but it's a small one. Or we may go in the attic or in the crawl space and we see mold everywhere. That would be a health item. So that's how we color code it. We typically do the orange and the red on site and go through those findings when we go through there. 
So um, I, that's how I would do it. You know, if you're familiar with your inspector's report, it'll be easy to go into the report and you can find the items that you wanna go through and address. Uh, remember, if you think it's major, then feeling, then that feeling will influence the buyer. So when we're trying to present our findings, we're letting them know, we're saying, listen, this is what the issue is. This is, uh, you know, we don't usually use cost because it can be, you know, they, they tend to hold you to it, but we let them know, we give them an, an, uh, an idea of what it can be done to fix it and who they would need to contact to fix it. So, you know, once we present the findings, we'll let them know, say, you know, for example, damper clamps come up quite a bit. We'll let them know, say, listen, you know, your fireplace, uh, your house was built before these were required. They started requiring them five or six years ago. It's a $2, $4 part, and you can install it pretty easily. You just take a metal clamp, clamp it on the damper, and you're off on your own. So don't let it, you know, you know, just because it's a red item, it's a safety item, doesn't mean it needs to kill the deal. So we try to explain that to them what a damper clamp is. So that's pretty much it. Uh, those are some of the aggravations that we see as home inspectors that we see that slow the things down um, in our side of it. I'm, a, you know, I, I'm guessing that you guys will see the same thing. Are, you know, if you want, are there any, um, let me stop sharing here. Are there any questions that you guys have or anything uh, that's an aggravation from your side? Uh, feel free to post those. Uh, let me get to these questions here. So uh, mold, uh, mold inspection extra, if so, how much? So um, we will do, so with our inspections, we will do a visual mold assessment. So we're looking for visible signs. Uh, that is different than a mold inspection. So a mold inspection is where we're actually taking samples and sending to a lab. So the mold assessment is free. Um, but if your client specifically says, I'm worried about mold, then they would want to get a mold inspection where we're actually taking lab samples and sending them to the lab of the areas they're concerned about. Uh, and that's usually done by air quality. So yes, it is going to be extra. Um, it's, um, it depends on how big the house is, but an average 2000 square foot house, uh, on top of the inspection fee would be 225 or no, it's 250, sorry, 250. Uh, and each additional sample that's needed, it would be 75. So uh, the 250 would cover 2,000 square feet. Uh, and then if uh, another 1,000 square feet was out on the house, if it's uh, 3,000 square foot, they would need uh, an extra sample. So, so yeah, there's, there's no, if you have to take lab samples, those are extra. Um, if it's just a visual and we're looking for visible signs, um, that's not going to be, there's no charge for that. Um, but keep in mind, mold can be hidden behind walls, so there's stuff that we won't be able to see. Uh, anybody else have questions? Anyone? So my contact information is, um, I don't have it on this slide, but uh, my name is Scott. My email is scott <clears throat> at Signature More. If you look down on the banner in the back, that's our phone number. Um, that's uh, our web address. And uh, we have a lot of resources on our website. Um, our website probably has two, 300 pages on it from blogs to uh, trusted vendors that we work with uh, to our package pricing. You know, we do have different packages where if they want to order more than just an inspection, they can get a discounted rate. Um, <clears throat> the one thing about our online scheduler is that you can actually go online and you can see what is available real time. Um, there's been times where we'll have real estate agents say, you know, how many, uh, you know, what do you have available in the next few days? Well, what I usually say is as of this conversation, we have this, this, and this, but within an hour, those could be gone. So if you're, if you don't quite know when you're going to have the inspection yet, my recommendation is just go online, look at the real time scheduler if your inspector has it, and then that way they can schedule real time online. Um, uh, for any of you real estate agents that uh, would like to be on a podcast and help promote yourself, uh, we do do a podcast. If you're interested in doing a podcast where I would interview you and we would promote that on social media, YouTube, uh, and it would be on all the podcast platforms, uh, send me an email scott at signaturemore.com and we could set up a tw you know half an hour to an hour call where we can just talk and uh, ask questions and then promote your your business so if anybody's interested in that let me know uh, or if you just have general questions about home inspections or if you have a question about something that came up on somebody else's report feel free to send me an email uh, and i'd be I'd be happy to take a look at it for you
When okay. specifically should a buyer come at the end an hour after start? So uh, in our inspection, um, when it go, when our confirmation email goes out, it usually tells you that inspection is going to take two to three hours. So uh, the rule of thumb, like I was saying, is, is if the home is um, a 2,000 square foot home, if we started at 10, I would have them be there at 12. So, you know, most houses are going to take uh, at least two hours to do the inspection. So uh, if we start at 10, I would have your buyers there at uh, 12. If uh, we start at two, have them be there at four. Um, you know, again, they can come anytime they want, but if you want to speed the process up and get in and get out, um, you know, usually have them come at the end. Uh, how long does it take to, to do a 2000 square foot house? Again, uh, typically one hour per thousand. Uh, again, we will not always know until we get there. Um, there's a, you know, there could, you know, a 2000 square foot condo that is brand new may take an hour and a half. Uh, a 2,000 square foot house that's, you know, 60 years old and has never been made could take four hours. So it's, you know, usually the good idea is one hour per thousand. Uh, if the realtor gave just one option and that inspector missed big issues, can the realtor be sued? Anybody can be sued anytime, anywhere. Um, yes, they can be sued. So I, you know, we, we've got contracts that basically, um, uh, basically say that we go to arbitration. That doesn't stop anybody from suing us. So um, anybody can be sued at any time. Um, how do you inspect solar panels? So we do not inspect solar panels. Uh, if you need solar panels inspected, our recommendation is, is that you have a professional solar company come out and inspect the panels. Um, home and most home inspectors are not qualified to inspect panels. If they offer that as a service, I would make sure that they uh, have uh, whatever's required in order to inspect them. Because a lot of times they will say we inspect what, uh, solar panels. Uh, well, what are they inspecting? Are they just inspecting to make sure they're cleaned? Are they inspecting that they've got power? I mean, how you, you want to, it's, it's a specialty item. So I would make sure you bring a specialist out to inspect those. Uh, for water heater, do they have to be strapped according to the code and is sediment trap required or nice to have? Uh, water heaters are, uh, they have to be strapped properly. So in our reports, uh, I would say most of the time that is probably the most common write up in our report because most of them are not strapped properly. There's specific ways that you have to uh, strap a water heater depending on where it's located. So if it's freestanding, <clears throat> and it's not touching a wall, then it has to have two straps. And it depends on the size too. If it's a 50 square foot or if a 50 gallon water heater tank, it needs two straps, a third of the way down, a third of the way up and has to go all the way around. Uh, it has to be the correct strapping as well. Um, if it's a 75 gallon tank, it needs three straps. If it's a hundred gallon tank, it needs four straps. Uh, and also where it's placed, if it's up, up against the wall, um, then you can use backing boards on it. So there's different ways. So um, if you go in there and type in California water heater strapping requirements in Google, you'll be able to see what the strapping requirements are. Um, there was one more question on that one that I didn't get to see. Let me look at it really quick. <clears throat> Let's see, sediment trap. Uh, sediment trap, it depends. If it's a recent install on a furnace and a water heater, yes, has to have a, a sediment strap. Um, if it's an older home, most inspectors are gonna uh, put it in the report still and be recommended. They're not that expensive, expensive to put in. But what the sediment trap is, is basically keeps the sediment that's in the gas, whether it be oil, whether it be water, whether it be shavings from the pipe, from getting into the burner and damaging the burner. So, um, it's recommended that each uh, gas burning uh, appliance or, you know, like a water heater furnace or even a, a pool heater have a sediment trap installed. Uh, it, every inspection that we do, uh, if we don't see one, we're going to put it in the report. If it's, uh, if it's an older home and it wasn't required at the install, it would go in there as a blue maintenance item. If it's a brand new install and there's not one in there, it goes in there as a recommended repair. Uh, for example, I had my water heater replaced last year and they didn't install the sediment trap. And I'm like, where's the sediment trap? You have to install it. They, water heaters now have to have permits. So if they install a new water heater and they don't give you a permit, they're not doing it correctly. They have to give you a permit. Um, they, have to have, they have to have a permit to install water heater now. So 
Uh, they don't mess around with these water heaters. Uh, we're in an earthquake zone and the problems that we have after earthquake, uh, after significant earthquakes are fires and fires are typically started by uh, gas lines that snap. <clears throat> All right, I think that's it. We got one more. See, do you check the yard for buried items? No, we do not. That's not part of a standard home inspection. So uh, there may be companies, we don't have set, uh, septic tanks that much down here. There may be some areas that have septic tanks, but I don't know of any home inspection company in our area that's, that inspects for septic tanks. Uh, that's something you'd have to have a septic tank. Um, what would you want to be checking in for buried items, you know, uh, piping and stuff? So you have to keep in mind that a home inspection is visual. Anything that we can see visually, that's what we're inspecting. Uh, if we have to tear stuff apart or dig stuff up, that's, that's outside the scope of a home inspection. All right, well, everybody have a good day. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Thank you.